Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Denon PMA-600NE amplifier. So this unit is readily available so you can purchase it now. Often the amplifiers that come into the workshop of course are older and no longer available. And in terms of general specifications you have RMS power output of 45 watts per channel into 8 ohm speakers but this will increase to 70 watts if you connect 4 ohms. And then total harmonic distortion is good, so this comes in at 0.01% for 8 ohm speaker load at test frequency of 1 kHz. And then frequency response is 5 Hz up to 100 kHz. And you can also connect a turntable directly, so that needs to have a moving magnet type cartridge. And input sensitivity is standard there to 2.5 millivolts. And then for your remaining analog line inputs, they are all at 100 millivolts. And the amplifier also supports a subwoofer output as well. And you can have a record out. So maybe you want to connect that to some form of audio recording device. And nice feature and kept, you know, throughout many of even like the modern day amplifiers. You still have this quarter inch jack socket where you can connect some high quality headphones for personal listening. And you have the direct mode selection, again from front fascia or from the remote control, which just bypasses the tone control circuits. And then from, again, remote or from from fascia, you can select analog mode. Um, and then analog, of course, is, you know, uh, the inputs, which would be, you know, your sort of line inputs and then MM inputs for your phono. But if you select then the digital mode, the nice thing there is that you have the DAC converter. And then from the rear, you can connect a coaxial input, optical one and optical two. And this amplifier also supports what you would expect on a more modern amplifier is Bluetooth connection version 4.2. And then dimensions, height is 122 millimeters with a width of 434 and then a depth of 307. And weight is typical, so coming in at 7.4 kilograms. And this amplifier is available in two colors. So there's also a black version. And there's also the 800NE as well available and the appropriate sort of accessories that, that go along with that. So what was the issue when this amplifier came into the workshop? Well, this amplifier, you know, isn't that old. Um, what you found was that if you had it connected to speakers or you connected any headphones to it, if you sort of left it running maybe for a couple of minutes, probably less than that, what you found there was a very, very loud sort of crackling, almost like a loud static noise, which was coming through on the left channel. And even if you adjusted the volume control, it really didn't make much of an impact as such. But what was noticeable is if you press the direct mode, effectively bypassing the tone control circuit, there was no noise at all. So that told you that the issue was emanating from the tone control board. So what I show here, and it's not, no, I wouldn't say it's probably the easiest to sort of remove the fascia, you know, it's like any sort of amplifier, you know, you have multiple screws that you need to remove and then just unconnect, you know, some of the connectors so you can pull it forward. But um, during the sort of initial sort of testing, before I sort of got into the strip down to get access to the tone board, um, these kind of faults sometimes can be thermally related. So maybe the component heats up and then internally goes noisy. And that can be both, you know, high integrated circuits or it could be transistors or indeed, you know, capacitors can also go noisy. Or maybe it's an intermittent solder joint, whatever it may well be. So just as initial sort of testing, what I was looking at is IC61, which is the dual operational amplifier on the tone board. And we'll get into that in a second. But I was just applying just some uh, freezer spray onto there just momentarily and it sort of disappeared. So I thought, oh, OK, we've got like a, a thermal problem on this IC. But then sometimes when it sort of, you know, the, the frost sort of cleared off it and then it was back at ambient temperature. Even if you sort of just give it a little, little slight tap with a plastic tool, it would disappear again. So you're thinking, hmm. so I sort of just flex the board and it kind of indicates almost like maybe there was a crack on the board or something. So, of course, that requires you, you know, to do further investigation. So once I'd sort of removed the tone board and you can see it here sort of uh, 
extracted from the amp but it's sort of semi-connected because of course I still need to sort of test it um, in terms of strip down once you pull the fascia forward what you will need to do is to remove the fixing screw for the headphone socket and you'll also need to remove the fixing screws for the power switch because how it sort of slots in and there's probably about seven fixing screws on the tone board and remember that you need to disconnect the volume control knob pull it off and then also the other treble balance and uh, bass control knobs and then remove the fixing nuts so that's all free and then once the headphone sorry once the headphone socket is out and the power switch there's a series of little sort of tab clips so you just need to be very careful you know don't break them just be very careful and just lift them up and then you'll be able to just pull away the tone board and then you know get to fault finding and working on it because the power switch you know you don't want to sort of screw it back into position what i would tell you to do is just you know put it in some form of insulating bag that's what i do the last thing you want is it you know to accidentally touch the chassis of the amplifier and cause other issues once that was then done what i'm now showing you here is ic61 now what is very very strange is as i'm showing you and i've sort of indicated this with a with the arrow the uh, ic on pin six was never soldered at manufacturer now it's a bit of a head scratcher how that could have actually happened because normally they're not soldered by hand so they go through some form of automated process so you think well was there a number of amplifiers that slipped through you know the, the manufacturing and sort of quality control testing or is this just an isolated amplifier but really odd and as you see it's not where maybe there was insufficient solder there was just none applied at all so that was the bit that when i was flexing it and even doing the freezer spray of course what was happening was the pin from the ic was making intermittent contact with the circuit and hence why the noise disappeared and then when the noise then came back so what i show is the before and after so you can see here that the ic pin not soldered and then here i'm then showing you you know what and what i did was i just reflowed the whole of the ic you know just in case there was anything else amiss and then just cleaned off any residual flux now what i'm next showing you is the extract from the service manual and what you can see is ic61 um another full sort of um, schematic because you know this is what you have to do with the surface manual you know it's extremely detailed so they don't just show individual sections you know you sort of have to zoom in to get access just to a particular area that you're looking at and but what you do see is the input output connections for the left and then the right channel then so dual operational amplifier nothing complicated and as i say you know once that was reflowed then it then fixed the issue and then in terms of reassemble just the reverse of that not difficult at all but when it, we sort of came to the test phase what i did notice was that the bias on this amplifier was slightly high uh, probably unusually high it was probably about 15 to 16 millivolts so I'm, I'm sort of a little bit surprised how that again got through manufacture maybe it was a friday afternoon unit but in terms of setting up the bias dead easy to do right so just leave the amplifier running for about 20 minutes and then what i'm showing here is the extract from the service manual which shows you the bias trimmers this is both left and right channel and then you have the test connectors on the board now what I would always say is, you know, don't sort of try and balance your multimeter leads, you know, and then try and make your adjustment. Just get some little hook clips, pop them on your multimeter probes, and then connect them onto the test pins. That will avoid any slippages or accidental shorting out of components. So you would have the volume control at minimum, the balance controls at center point with no speakers connected, no headphones, or no input signal. And then what you're looking to do here is to adjust the bias for each one of the channels to set it to factory level, which is 10 millivolts. The service manual will give you a tolerance of plus or minus one millivolt, and that's standard. But if you just make that adjustment, then you're back, as I said, to factory. So I wouldn't say this is sort of like a, a complicated repair and sort of what I'm sort of showing you now as we sort of draw to an end of this repair tutorial. It's just really to just show you some of the insights so you can see uh, the DAC converter uh, if you will need to remove that there's fixing screws at the rear and then it sort of unplugs from the main board and then you can also see here the low voltage power supply as well as the uh, the transformer and a side view so again 
If you need any help or you need any support, by all means, email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com and uh, I'll be more than happy to come back and provide you with any support. So hopefully you've, uh, you've learned something along the way and I appreciate you stopping by. Until the next time, cheers, bye-bye.